face to face. Good evening and welcome to Face to Face. I'm Niresh Eliyatambi. My guest tonight is the Honorable Iran Vikramaratna, Member of Parliament from the SJB. Welcome, Iran. Thank you. So, uh, Iran, you're going to tell us about the latest developments in politics and the, the country, throughout the country. And uh, Mr. Palita Rangabandara is making some news these days. Uh, saying that a large number of members from your party are about to join the UNP, uh, specifically on the 10th of March, uh, when an election campaign is supposed to be kicked off. Uh, can we have your reaction to this? And you're smiling already. <laughs> Did you ask him which year? <laughs> March? <laughs> uh, I think it's actually not worth even uh, answering the question uh, because, uh, you know, People like this say all kinds of things, and things which have no basis at all, you say. And these stories have been there for quite some time, that always, you know, there are people from the SJB going, and the absolute nonsense. Okay, so yeah. uh, we'll probably ask you again after the 10th of March, and uh, you'll, you'll probably be smiling at that time as well, I presume. <laughs> uh, so, Iran, uh, tell yeah. us uh, about your party's preparations for the upcoming election. First of all, um, are you all preparing for a presidential election or a general election or both? And which one would you prefer? Uh, I would say we have no preference. We are ready for any election. Uh, we are the main party in the opposition of the country. And uh, we have a very extensive grassroots network uh, by electorate right down to the <coughs> uh, polling station. So in the polling station itself, we have a certain uh, organization that we have, and that's the traditional way that big political parties, the small ones can't even get close to it, uh, organize themselves. So you have men, women, youth, and you organize like that. So that's kind of a very base, uh, sick way of organizing yourself. Uh, and then we have the organizer for the electorate, and then we have district organizers. In addition to that, uh, we have uh, you know a sectoral uh, uh, organizations as well. So uh, the sectoral organizations uh, were quite vast, you know, depending on sometimes its employment categories. Uh, you know, so you have teachers, you have armed forces, ex armed forces, and then you'll have. Uh, trade unions, like there's a whole range of sectoral uh, organizations as well. Uh, so, uh, so there are so many things you do in a large party organizing yourself. Uh, and then we, what we do is we go and the organizer has responsibility for that particular electorate. Uh, so he has his uh, committed voter base and then he has to focus on the floating voter. Now, uh, uh, when I spoke to you a few days ago, you were down south um, visiting yeah. with your party organizers, I presume. Yeah. Uh, what's the mood of the public when yeah. it comes to uh, the country and the government and the possibility of elections? Yeah, I, I think the vast majority of people are waiting for an election. And uh, partially the reason is with the social change that happened uh, with the Aragalaya. Uh, they they got rid, if you want, of uh, uh, family uh, and from all their positions, uh, but they didn't get rid of the government. And uh, lots of them feel that the government may be legal but not legitimate. Parliamentarians, even like myself, are legal but not legitimate. Uh, that sense is there, and a feeling that. Uh, you know, people must be given the opportunity actually to elect people and, and a feeling that there should be lots of new faces as well. And I think in a democracy, we have to accept that, uh, you know, so people will vote some old faces and they will vote new faces and that's a part of democracy. Uh, which election, uh, uh, there's no preference there. Legally, the presidential election is due uh, between roughly the 18th of September and October. Uh, and uh, so that will have to be held, and so that will have to be called earlier, and so there will be basically an uh, election campaign for that. And the president uh, can, if he wants to, uh, call for a general election, because 
parliament is elected for five years, but after two and a half years, he has a discretion if he wants to call for a general election. Which he hasn't done so far. Which he hasn't done, and if he does that, I mean, that's fine with us as well, you see. Yeah. So, when we organize at the grassroots level, you know, we, we are really prepared for any election. Uh, today, there is a mistaken idea that, uh, you know, everything you see on social media is where it is going, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, Niresh, you referred to me being down south, and I went down south, right, all the way to Buttala in this particular situation, uh, because the local MPs there, you know, MP Dharmasen and the others told me for a while, you need to come, you need to come, you need to address this crowd, and I finally said, what's the crowd? And they told me, I I'm giving you an undertaking that is, is going to be, um, they yesterday told me the count, they said 350 people who were non SJB. They were really from the SLPP and, and some members of the JVP as well, who wanted to come and listen to what had to be said, because obviously they are also looking for answers. And uh, it's a very successful meeting. Some local councillors in those areas actually came uh, publicly and they pledged to basically work with the SJB. Uh, some were actually given the opportunity because they came forward. I said, let me give them the microphone so that they can say what they want publicly. So quite contrary to sometimes, you know, what you see on social media, because social media is driven also uh, by funding is needed for it, you know, and uh, some, some parties have focused on it. And I'm all for media and for social media. But I'm saying the ground situation is not always what you see and hear. It was a clear example uh, of that. Uh, so uh, Sajid Premadasa himself travels very extensively throughout the country. Uh, so we are, we are going about it in, in a democratic way, preparing for it. So you spoke of social media campaigns. And uh, of late, we see uh, some parties uh, seem to have already begun their social media campaigns uh, for an election. Uh, has your party begun yet, or what are your plans? Yeah, uh, I would say this, uh, uh, you know, we, we are the main opposition party, and we had one clear objective from the time this parliament was formed, and that was basically to play our role legitimately and properly, you know, uh, in parliament as an opposition, which we did. And our goal was when we saw the government had wrong policies and was mishandling the economy, Right, we worked at opposing the government. We played our role, and then finally bringing down the government. Uh, and in doing that, we kept the opposition largely united. We never attacked any opposition party. Uh, we had a lot of crossovers from the SLPP government who came and sat in the opposition, various groups there. Uh, so that was our role. That's the role the SJB played. So we started to campaign only in the election year 2024, and we started only in January 2024. There have been some opposition parties who have been campaigning for a year and a half and taking their message, preparing for an election, both in Sri Lanka and sometimes going to expatriate populations, Sri Lankan populations overseas and doing all of that, which is fine. Everybody has the freedom to do, everybody can have a strategy, which is fine. But we have started to campaign only now. And now we are taking our message forward and now we don't have to focus, in, in a sense, on, uh, you know, uh, we have to hold everybody together because our focus is the government. You see, now our focus is the election, and our focus is actually taking uh, office and making the changes that are necessary. And we are cl very clear, our party is there to take government. If you put it another way, capture government. But I make a distinction, not capture the state but capture government. Because we believe in democracy, we believe that the end and the means are both equally important. I can't say that of all parties uh, competing in the election when you look at the history of some of those parties. Now, Iran, uh, no one seems to be very sure of whether any one party would get a majority in parliament because we don't have extensive polling in this country. Um, should the SJB fail to get an absolute majority in Parliament, uh, and I'm sure you'll say that you're confident that you, your party will, but should it not get an absolute majority, uh, has, has your party given any thought to coalitions? 
Uh, coalitions are not new to uh, you know Sri Lankan politics, right? Uh, and uh, I, I think the fundamental is that everybody needs to agree on the philosophy. But if you don't agree on the philosophy, there's no point partnering just to form a government. There's no point doing that because it will, for example, right, if I give you some examples, concrete examples, uh, right, state-owned enterprises, right, if their parties are going to say these are national assets and we have to hold them in government and keep them, make no changes, obviously that's not our, our philosophy. Our philosophy is uh, workers are important, but our philosophy is that the voters, the citizens are important. If there is a state enterprise, it must benefit the citizens of this country. So there are some loss-making enterprises, huge loss makers. And those loss makers, the poor taxpayer is paying for those losses. And therefore, uh, we are very clear, some loss-making enterprises need to be shut down because maybe the private sector can do it better. Some loss-making enterprises should be privatized. Some loss-making enterprises can be public private partnerships. When it comes to utilities, we will take a more strategic look at utilities because everybody needs to have utilities. For example, uh, you know, I was just told this week that uh, you know, in some houses the water has been cut, right? I won't treat water as a privatization subject at all. This is a utility. Everyone has a right to water. And I suggested, though I'm in opposition, that maybe the low unit consumers of water, the poor houses should be given water even free, you see. So, so, so we have a policy, we are clear on state-owned enterprises, right. So then if you take education, I'll give you another example. When it comes to education, we believe in, in the state providing education and that's what we have done for the last 75 years. But we also believe that private suppliers of education are legitimate and we have got this wrong for 50 years because some parties got on the street, held boards, opposed it. And as a result, what has happened? What a mess we have made out of this. And therefore, the middle class in this country are sending their children overseas, those who can afford it. And some now are sending them to uh, local institutes because they're not even allowed to use the word university. That's, that's what it's really. So uh, we are very clear that we, we are saying private suppliers are also legitimate. We are also saying uh, non-government, non-profit distributing, right? Institutions are also legitimate. So what is the role of the state? The role of the state is regulation and making sure there's quality. We don't want, you know, uh, institutions which don't have quality being set up here. At the same time, we want to invite top foreign universities to come and set up in this country. Uh, last year, there was a select committee of parliament and uh, it debated for nearly six months. A select committee is all the parties sitting around a table, if you like, if I put it like that, and trying to agree on some broad principles. And this was on higher education. After six months of discussion, there was a report <coughs> right, that came out. Vijaydas Rajapaksa, was, as a minister, was chairman of that committee. And uh, we agreed that the spend on higher education must go up. Spend on education must go up as a percentage of GDP. We agreed on that. We agreed that private sector is legitimate, right? The, and non-government, non-profit distributing segment is legitimate. We agreed government's role is in regulation and in quality control. We agreed on all of that. Then when the report came, we had to sign. When we had to sign, right, most of us signed, but then Basically, the NPP representative sent a letter saying that uh, we can't sign because we feel that the government education uh, system will be weakened if we sign this. And I was like, what? You know, you government universities being weakened? They are already ranked below 1,000 on the international rankings. We certainly need to work at strengthening them. There's no question about it. But to say because of that that we are not going to let other legitimate institutions come and set up in this country, right? Uh, somebody else came and told me, you know, if we agree with what the report is saying, uh, you have a university lecturer in a state university, he might leave and he might go and want to join a private university in the country. So I said, what's the problem? What's the problem? I said, a mother has three kids. One child at most will go to Sri Lankan State University. The mother wants all three kids educated. So one might go to a private university, might, might go into vocational training, one might go into maybe the professional training. 
for the mother all the children are equal, all the children are equal. She does not care whether that teacher is teaching her eldest or her youngest, that is immaterial. Look at it another way, if that opportunity is there. Otherwise that lecturer, and this is happening, leaves the country and goes overseas looking for a job. Then they come and complain and say brain drain, brain drain. I said this is nonsense, we have to change the education system, we have to provide access to all, we have to get out of this, we have to break out of the mistakes of the last 75 years, we have to make English language absolute access to everybody in this country. So the SJB, we have a clear program, we want people to know it and if they feel that our program is wrong and they want to continue in the same way, it is a democracy, people have to decide. Now, you spoke of brain drain and that is a key issue which any future government is going to have to deal with and grapple with. Um, over a million Sri Lankans left the country uh, in the past two years alone. Um, that is huge um, and we will see millions more leaving. And it is public sentiment more than anything else as well as of course the lack of jobs. Uh, how would your party deal with such a situation? Because if, if and when you come into government, that is one of the key issues. Do you believe that an election will reverse that trend? Uh, yes, I think that uh, there are uh, many, many issues why there is a brain drain. But if I could uh, 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 kind of simplify it to two broad areas. One broad area is that the lack of the rule of law. Particularly younger people feel strongly about it. They feel that the rule of law does not apply to everybody equally. They do not like the system, right? They just do not like the system. You know, they, when, they, when, they, when they see things like, right, convicted people are sitting in the Sri Lankan parliament, convicted people. When they say, right, a convicted murderer was sworn in by the Speaker of the House, Right? When they see that kind of thing, right? uh, when they see right, uh, uh, you know, what is happening, you know, being unequally treated, right? even in simple things, even you know, when ordinary people get arrested, they are thrown in uh, a remand and, and uh, politicians get arrested, they are thrown in a hospital, you know what I mean. So this issue, I am just giving you a few examples but it is very, very prevalent. Uh, people see a society which is not equal and the rule of law does not apply to everybody. So one of the things is I think we have to work at correcting that and that is absolutely important. So one of the practical things that we will do is, right, we will create a, a public prosecutor's office, independent public prosecutor, not the attorney general. The attorney general is the lawyer to the government, right, and then you are expecting them when the personnel in the government rob and steal and cheat to basically institute cases, the track record for the last 50 years is poor, you say. So we need an independent public prosecutor. Now when we move into this, I must give this government some credit for actually bringing a new law on anti-corruption. It is a good law, a much better law than we have had. The issues are more now on implementation, the law is good. But the implementation is where really it is weak. But, but that uh, is exactly the point with many laws. We yeah. have a plethora of laws uh, which seem to cover everything. Correct. But it is in the implementation of the law that uh, things seem to fall down more often than not. Correct, correct. So that issue is there and, and we want to create an independent public prosecutor. Governments will come, governments will go, cases must go on, it can't be withdrawn. If the courts decides to remove it, then that is different. So answering that question about the brain drain, I would say rule of law, establishing the rule of law is one. Then corruption is the other big issue which people get sick and tired of and at every level this corruption issue is there, right. So uh, we, we will create a, a centralized revenue collection authority. So if you go to customs or if you go to the Indian revenue, you go to excise, right, they will process the transaction but you do not get into discussions with anybody there, it will come electronically and your payments are made to the central authority. So we have thought through practically, you know, when others are going around saying we will get corruption, we will go and get stolen assets, you know, we will put people in prison, 
we are very clear at the end, end game. But the means is the issue. How do you actually get there? We want to do it within the judicial framework that everybody is treated uh, properly and then those who have done wrong are basically punished. But also we are trying to reduce corruption by reducing the interaction between the pair and the government officials. So that's another thing we will do. So this whole area of rule of law, the other thing uh, why there is a brain drain is that people's incomes have been affected. So you, had, you have your incomes like you had three years ago, virtually at the same level, but the cost of living has soared up. Uh, while the government argues now that inflation has come down, which is correct, inflation has come down. It was 70% inflation, 100% food inflation, and now it's come to single digits. But what inflation means is the rate of increase. And it's a percentage. It's, it's a percentage, and it's a rate of increase. But the cost of living hasn't come down. That's the issue. And therefore, people can't manage. And, and so, so does the SJB have a plan to bring down or reduce the cost of living? Yes. So I, 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 I would, I would put it like this, right? That the cost is, the cost is there. Inflation now needs to be kept completely under control, right? And what we, sh what we should be doing is there are short-term measures and long-term measures. In the short-term measures, one of the things I have argued for right along, and I, I said this to the Minister of Finance two years ago when he presented the budget, and you know he brought the budget slabs and the percentages. That it was not just the poor, it was affecting the middle class. And I said, the tax-free slab, they paid 100,000. I said, no way, that should be at least 200,000. You see, because these are honorable people who go to work every day, look after their families, their extended families, you know. So we had to look at very practical things that we have to do. And as I said, those are more the short-term measures. The long-term measure is open up the economy. You see, open up the economy and, uh, you know, get more f uh, foreign investment into it and let the economy grow. Uh, I divert just for a moment because it, it, we have lost a famous figure in Ronnie DeMel. And uh, Ronnie DeMel, I remember as a young person, right, uh, because I worked for a foreign bank, invitations are given for heads of banks to come and listen to the budget speech, and that happens even today. And uh, because he was a foreigner, uh, he used to send me to listen to the budget speech as a young bank and economist. And, and those speeches were amazing. Long speeches, very analytical, and I learned a lot from him. And need to pay tribute to him because you asked about opening the economy. Right? He was the figure in opening the economy. And there was a secret there. George Evans was president. He appointed Ronnie DeMel. Right? And for 10 years, for 10 years, he was minister. J.R. Javadana didn't interfere with him. He put the right person in the job. And what was Dimmel's focus? His focus was keep the macroeconomic structure right. You see, today people look at finance ministers like, what can I get from them? And then different, different parties come, can I get this tax concession, that tax concession, or whatever. We had to get out of that. We had now, to get out of what that. What about the role of professionals in a future government? Uh, certainly, we need to have professionals coming into uh, future government, and it's absolutely necessary because they bring their knowledge and they bring their experience, right? But after what happened last week, I make a slight qualification. We need to bring professionals with ethics because last week, right, the Constitutional Council met, right, and, and, and there was a verdict against the acting IGP given by the judiciary, nothing to do with politics, what I'm saying, given by them. And, and there were professionals, right, on the, on, on the council, lawyers, in fact, right? Uh, uh, basically, <coughs> like you know, Mr. Nimasiri Pala de Silva, the minister was there. Then, then, then uh, uh, there was uh, Sagara Karyavasam, who was an MP, who is also a lawyer, professionals, right? And I was wondering on what basis, you know, a process was not followed. Process was not followed, right? In that. So our issue is process must be followed. So professionals are needed. Their knowledge is needed. Their experience is needed. But we need to bring ethical professionals because just, just being professional itself doesn't solve the problem. Absolutely. Um, and I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, our thanks to Mr. Eran Vikramaratna, MP, from, uh, representing the SJB. Uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, today, Iran.
Uh, don't go away because the People's Platform is coming up next. Thank you for watching. Good night. Did you like this video?